Awesome. So I'm just going to, this uh, presentation yeah. was just to give a <laughs> yeah, overall right. yeah. state of the market, talk about some real estate stats after we discuss some key mortgage facts that are going on. Uh, I'm just going to close the door so that we have a uh, He's a little quieter. I'm Jason Friesen. Got Jacob Manchowitz with me. And then we've got Jason Lang online who will be presenting. Uh, some of the stats online. It's just easier for him to do that than doing it in person. Uh, next slide, Jason. Just have a little bit of an agenda on what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the Bank of Canada, uh, the rate announcement yes. on April 12th. We're going to talk about the fixed rate environment. Talk about some mortgage rule changes and how it may impact market education. Uh, talk about the foreign buyer ban, uh, getting ready for multiple offers, the appraisal environment, and then talk about some, some trap stats after that. Next slide, Jason. So on April 12th, after eight consecutive rate announcements where we saw a rate increase, the Bank of Canada finally stood pat at a rate announcement. So from March of 2022 to January of 2023, we witnessed a 4.25% or 425 basis point increase to the Bank of Canada's overnight lending rate. Um, they held their rate announcement uh, firm for the second meeting in a row. Why? Uh, we are seeing inflation start to ease. I know that the number for April was up slightly again, uh, but it drops significantly from... Hey, I'm sorry, we're late. No worries. Hey. So it dropped significantly from, from February to March, and again, picked up slightly in April. Um, the bank does expect that CPI will eventually fall to about 3% middle of the year. Um, but as you know, we saw with inflation numbers yesterday, that is a bit of a moving target and there will be a bit of a rocky road. Um, another reason for the Bank of Canada sitting on the sidelines in April, um, you know, at the end of the day, there still is potentially some issues uh, with demand exceeding supply in the labor market. But overall, um, they're thinking right now that the monetary policy is restrictive enough to uh, keep it uh, to not raise rates and hopefully bring us down to the 2% target by the end of uh, 2023 or early in 2024. Next slide, Jason. So this is just a bit of a forecast on where the big banks are expecting the overnight lending rate to be by the end of 2024. So keep in mind the overnight lending rate is what variable rates are tied to. Uh, so the prime rate is based off of, that bank set is based off of the Bank of Canada's overnight lending rate. When you hear on the news about interest rates changing when the government has made changes to rates, this is talking about the overnight lending rate. Um, so when you take it, all the big banks, chief economists, and what they're forecasting, it does look like by the end of 2024, we should see about a 1.5% drop to the overnight lending rate and therefore prime. Currently, prime is at 6.7, so prime dropping to 5.2% is the expectation. Uh, you know, one of the banks thinks it will only be a percent lower, one thinks it will be 2% lower, but the consensus is that will be about 1.5% below where we are today. Next slide. So looking at where bond yields are, so keep in mind that bond yields are what fixed rates are tied to. Um, there's been a lot of turbulence since the start of the year. Um, you know, the expectation still is that we will see rates come down over the medium term. Keep in mind that bond yields basically are forecasting where the Bank of Canada, the economy will be moving. So I think what we're seeing right now is that there's you know, a pretty good opportunity to lock in some interest rates at the worst case. Again, there could be a bit of a rocky road as we end the year. Um, you know, rates could go up slightly or go down. Um, you, know, you can always have a client lock a rate and do a pre-approval right now. That basically will establish a worst case scenario for a 120 day rate period. So if rates go down within that 120 days, we'll automatically relock the interest rate. But conversely, if they go up, you do have your clients protected for that period of time. When clients are trying to work through their budgeting and figuring out you know, affordability and everything, it's good to have a, a rate lock so they know what they're looking, with, looking at as a worst case scenario. Next slide. So keep in mind, OSFI is the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions. They are who brought in the stress test a few years ago. 
We all know the impact of the stress test. Obviously, it's made affordability much more of a challenge. At the same time, the stress test likely did a pretty good job of saving the housing market over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, based on all the interest rate increases that we witnessed, had we not had people qualifying with stress test rates before, we like, likely would have seen a lot of people that potentially would have been in some pretty serious financial difficulty. Um, they basically, for any bank that's federally regulated or any mortgage company that gets their funding from a federally regulated bank, they set the guidelines for basically mortgages. And they have been in consultations for the last couple months. And there's been some talk coming down that there could be some tightening of rules. This is something that could create some headwinds in the housing market. There has been some talk about looking at making it harder for rental properties, potentially actually increasing the stress test for short-term uh, fixed and variable rates. Um, and, and so I think it might be a good opportunity if you have clients that are thinking about doing something to make sure that they are aware of you know where the numbers are today. And you know I think it is potentially something that does help people get off the sidelines because if we do see some rule changes that do make it harder to qualify, People are already stretched right now. If you look at rates from where they were last year to this year, there's about a 20 to 25% difference in what someone qualifies for. So anything further to make that more challenging will obviously take away the borrowing power of, of, of anyone who's looking to qualify for a mortgage. Next slide. So mortgages and tax time. We have a, a great article that I'll share with the leadership in uh, at, the, at the office here. But why it's important, if you have borrowers who are self-employed, it always makes sense to make sure that they are circling back after they file their current year's income taxes. It could potentially mean that they're either going to qualify for a little bit more or a little bit less than they did previous to filing this year's taxes. Keep in mind that 2020 was a pretty rough year for a lot of people for, uh, that were self-employed. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty. A lot of people, you know, their, their finances were impacted. So if someone was previously qualified based off of 2020 and 2021, now they're going to be looking at 2021 and 2022. So it could potentially give them a little bit of a boost from a, from a borrowing perspective. So it always makes sense to make sure that, uh, that your clients, uh, if they are self-employed, are definitely speaking to the mortgage broker just to get an understanding of what their new year tax filings may have an impact, how it may impact their pre-approval. Um, again, we have a, a you know a guide that we can share. Same with the next slide as well, Jason. Um, talking about the foreign buyer ban and NRST, we're all obviously aware of that. Um, so this is all stuff that we can share uh, from a marketing perspective. If this is something you want to have for your clients. Uh, the next slide. Uh, talking about, we also have another guide on multiple offers and and you know how to make sure you're positioning your clients about going firm and the risks and how we can potentially mitigate them. Looking at the current appraisal environment, um, you know, in an increasing uh, you know, uh, price market, you always want to be mindful that your clients are doing their due diligence to, to make sure that they have the means to potentially make up any shortfall if their appraisal comes in short. That's the one consideration as well as as well qualified as the borrower is. If there are issues with the appraisal on the property that does come in short, it could impact the amount that someone could potentially have available to access, you know, from a mortgage perspective. Um, so we have some strategies around that, and that's something that you can reach out and, and chat further about. I'm going to leave you with a few points before I turn it over to Jason to talk about some of the, the real estate stats. Um, in the last few days, there's been a few big announcements that, you know, will have positive and, you know, just maybe not massive you know, negative impacts. But uh, the first is that we have BMO that's going to be entering the mortgage broker space. Right now, the mortgage broker market share is about 40 to 50 percent. And that's with only three of the six big banks uh, available to the broker community. So adding another bank back into the mix is great for competition. It will mean that banks will, you know, be more aggressive to earn more market share. Um, I think it's fantastic. BMO was in the mortgage broker space for several years and got out in about 2010. So to have them coming back is fantastic. Uh, that will likely be by the end of the year. Um, there was an article in the Globe, the president of CMHC said that they will not be extending amortization past 25 years. Um, there was hope that we could see CMHC borrowers. So those are borrowers who are putting less than 20% down. Uh, potentially, you know, see amortization be set back up to 30 years again. 
Uh, the concern with CMHC is that it will add further fuel to the housing market by increasing more demand. And CMHC would rather focus on increasing supply. So I don't think we're going to see any changes to that. That did not sound like something that they were considering. So it will be status quo with that. Um, the U.S. raised the rate at early uh, May by a quarter point. That was expected. So I don't think that really moves the needle. Uh, the expectation is still that long term we'll see downward pressure on rates in the next year or so. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens with inflation. Inflation obviously ticked up slightly. It was expected to be slightly lower than it was in March. Um, you know, again, I think it'll be a bit of a rocky road before we get back inflation back in line. But I don't think this really changes anything from a rate perspective. You know, this small increase in uh, inflation in April doesn't really, you know, lead any economists right now to think that we're going to see a rate hike again. Most think that the Bank of Canada and the Fed in the U.S. are likely done and are going to sit on the sidelines. Seeing inflation tick up a little bit could potentially mean that they sit on the sidelines a little bit longer. But I think for the most part, it does look like, based on everything that we are, are seeing and reading right now, that, you know, the expectation is that rates have likely hit a peak. So we'll be continuing to monitor that and seeing the inflation numbers month over month, both in Canada and the U.S., will be key on kind of determining when we do actually see some potential, you know, rate cuts down the line. But again, it will be a bit of a rocky road to get there. So I'll leave you with that. I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Jason uh, Lang, and he's just going to take you through. I know we're, we're mortgage brokers, but we actually do a deep dive on the TREB stats every month. Uh, I think we may have presented them once here before. There's some pretty interesting information here, um, and this will also be available to you as, as realtor partners. We will, we've got a, a whole portal that we will provide that you can log in and see all the different uh, stats on a month over month basis. So where can we access that? I'll send it to you. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's For sure. excellent, by the way. For sure. Jason? Perfect. No, thanks, Jason. For the intro, uh, yeah, given our my, my background with just data analytics and understanding sort of the numbers, um, I found that, you know, getting access to to trends and things is, is a little bit difficult. So, you know, we do this, hopefully it's a value add. Um, and hopefully, you know, there are a few things that I can point out that maybe aren't in the mainstream media or are helpful in some way. So for th this presentation, uh, I'm going to be doing it for about it'll be about 10 minutes and I'll start with a high level review of the TREB results for April and then do a little bit of a deep dive um, looking at some specific areas to, to uncover possible trends that are changing heading into the spring, spring market. So that for this first table, we're just level setting, looking at year over year stats. Uh, no big surprise. We're comparing you know April this year to April last year, which was near peak of the market. So, you know, a lot of a lot of decreases, right? Sales down 5.2% year over year, new listings down 38%, active listings down 20.8%, average price down 7.8% and so on. Um, I think what's a lot more relevant is looking at how things are shaping up as we move month to month, um, as it paints a much more positive picture and actually a lot, a lot of things are changing pretty quickly. In terms of the number of sales, Moving from March 2023 to April 2023, number of sales were up 9.4%. Definitely some seasonality in there. Usually things pick up and we'll explore that a little bit later. In terms of new listings, um, not up as much as usual, but new listings up 1.5%, active listings up 2.5%, and average price up 4%. Um, on an overall TREB basis, uh, basically, you know, TREB hit a bottom in January. And then month to month, average price has started to rebound. Um, another interesting stat is sale price to list price. We'll dive into this, but it's moved up 101% to 103%. Usually an increasing sale price to list price could be a signal of more competition, uh, potentially a change in listing strategy. So a lot of movement on that front. And then you have listing days on market and property days on market dropping. So 19 to 17 and 27 to 24. So the next slide we're going to look at uh, is just analyzing the sales data for April. So what we're looking at here is uh, April this year versus April over the past 10 years. Uh, this year, 7,531 7, sales. Here's how it is broken down by uh, property type. One thing that stands out is April 2020. Uh, obviously, the market was on a complete standstill uh, April 2020, and that was the response to the COVID market lockdowns. So essentially, new listings and sales just stopped. Um, but a positive news is 
you know, we're not that far behind. It may feel extremely slow, although things are picking up, but we're not that far behind where we've been before. So, you know, the sales for this April were pretty close to what we saw in 2018, a little bit less than 2019, and in around what we saw last year. So the next section, I'm just gonna try and look at seasonality. So, you know, how did things shape up moving March to April? And we'll look at sales, new listings, active listings. So from a sales perspective, we just looked at it. Here's that 7,531 sales for April. And you can see where things came up from March. So, you know, a nice increase in the number of sales up 9.4%. And as I mentioned, you know, seasonality, usually you do see an increase moving March to April. Looking back here, 2014, 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019, you can see how March to April, you start to get an increase moving into the spring market. The exception to the rule was 2020, 21, 22. It's amazing how much activity happens in the spring market. But in 2020, you had that initial COVID slowdown. So you just saw how sales plummeted from March to April in 2020. In 2021, it was almost the opposite. Um, March 2021 was the most number of sales in TREB ever. Uh, and basically that was kind of call it the peak in terms of sales volume. And then things started to slow. And then last year, um, March 2022 was the start of the Bank of Canada rate increases. And we know, you know, once they started in March, they increased eight uh, successive times and that really slowed the market. So you could argue that, you know, this, this recent increase that we're seeing in sales is the first time that we've been back to sort of normal seasonal patterns over the past 10 years. So I think that, you know, that that's a strong message. Um, now, if we assume that sales are normalizing, getting back to normal, uh, so demand, what about supply? Uh, so the next slide we're looking at here, very similar setup. Uh, you've got the num oh, I'm hearing a little bit of an echo, but it's okay. Um, what you've got here is uh, new listings. So 11,364 new listings for April, relatively flat from March. And then this is where you hold your chair and you say, okay, we know we had a, you know very few listings, but what do we usually see? The number of new listings that you typically see for an April are anywhere between 16,000 to 21,000. So the fact that we only had 11,000 new listings come out in TREB, um, it, you know, is, is significant, extremely significant. Um, you know, not only is that 11,364 number low, but TREB started tracking, you know, a lot of people say, well, it's double counting the new listings because there's you know, addresses that are taken off and put back on. And that's absolutely correct. Um, May last year, TREB started tracking the number of those new listings that are actually the same address coming off and going back on. And in fact, 13.7% of the new listings were relists. Uh, that's, you know, that sounds like a high number, but it's actually down quite a lot from last year. During 2022, last year, you had relists running around 22 to 29% you know, in any given month. So I think that speaks to you know, maybe people having to reprice properties previously, whereas you know now things are starting to sell um, at, at, at the initial price. So all that rolls together to basically come up with choice. So if you're on MLS and you're looking across TREB, how many properties do you have to choose from for your clients? Uh, at the end of April, there were 10,373 properties listed for sale, and that was up only about 2.5% from, uh, oh, sorry, that should say March uh, versus April but that was only up 2.5% versus the previous month. Normally you get a much bigger bump. So you have you know, a much broader or wider uh, range of active listings to choose from. Um, we're, at a, we're at a very low for April, but not only are we at a low, we didn't see that usual jump that you get moving from March to April. So, you know, and actually a couple last slides on this. This total number masks what's actually going on in the underlying property types. So if we break this 10,373 active listings number down by property type, I think it paints a, a much better picture of what's going on right now. Here's the low rise segment. So if you look at detached homes, across TREB there were 4,536 detached active listings available for sale at the end of April. That's the lowest that we've seen um, by, a long, a long, uh, by a long shot. And move to another property type, semi-detached, only 455 semi-detached homes were available for sale at the end of April much less, you know, more than half less than you typically see. Then things start to climb a little bit. Townhomes, 1,350, you know, it has been lower before. And then condos. We've been focused on condos for a number of months as it started the year with a relatively high number of active listings. And it's remained there, although it's starting to slowly come down. 
Um, and in fact, if you look March to April, you could see that you know, it was basically flat in terms of the number of active listings. So could be a great opportunity, you know, just given the supply demand dynamic, could be an opportunity for first time home buyers, investors to maybe get an opportunity at, at a condo in this current marketplace before maybe it starts to tighten. So, you know, how does this supply demand dynamic impact average price? So as I mentioned, um, if we just look at sort of the bottom of the market, you could argue January, 2023, was the bottom of the market. And since then, overall average price is slowly ticked up, moving month to month. And we're now sitting at you know 1,153,000 for an average price across all TREP properties. Breaking it down by property type, this is a 10 year history of average price by detached, which is blue, semis, which are red, townhomes, which is gray, and condos, which are black. And the one thing you can really point out here is that the low rise segment has increased more rapidly than the condo segment. So you can see over here, just moving from January to April, you see detached semis and towns kind of have, have grown about 11%, whereas condos up five and a half. And that I think speaks to that supply demand dynamic in the market right now. Um, you know, what, one slide to keep in mind is yes, you know, we can get fixated on looking at everything month to month to month, but if you take a broader view and look at the trend market as a whole, um, so if, you know, if a buyer's been in a property for five, 10 years, it's been a very strong market. Right. Uh, if you look at example detached property back in April 2013 and compare it to today, on average, you know, that detached property has grown 127% or about 8.5% compounded each year over the past 10 years. So, yes, a lot of volatile months, but over the long term, things have been, you know, performed very well within the trend marketplace. So, last thing um, I'll leave you with, I, I will touch on. I'll have a slide on the rental market, but the last uh, slide for the resale market is just this concept of sale price versus list price. Um, as a reminder, you know, the sale price to list price ratio is essentially if, if you're holding a property out for sale for $100 and it sells for 110, then that's 110% um, sale price to list price. So maybe that's driven by multiple offers, maybe it's driven by a lower listing price or vice versa. If something sells for $97 versus 100, that's a 97% sale price to list price. So a lot of a lot of things are changing um, from this respect. So what we're looking at here is just the Toronto 416 market, um, Central East West, and you can see how things shaped up for detached property at the start of the year. Sale price to list price about 97%. So if a buyer's looking at that listing, you know, on average, it would sell for 97% of the list price. Fast forward to April, and that sale price to list price for detached homes has climbed to 104%. So now all of a sudden that listing isn't necessarily reflective of what it will sell for. And in fact, some areas that, you know, typically see much higher sale price to list price are increasing rapidly. For example, Toronto East has moved up from 100% to 109%. Semi-detached in Toronto East has moved 103 to 115% uh, and so forth. You know, condos haven't moved that much. It's still right around that 100% range. Um, just to give some overview, you know, here's some of the other regions across Toronto. Uh, this is happening, you know, across most regions. The exception might be, you know, Dufferin County, but York and Durham, you could see you're moving up to 105, 106, 110, 112. So a lot, you know, a lot is changing, and I think changing quickly. And it's important to stay on top of that. Uh, with respect to, you know, we do break these uh, charts and this information down into 40 different tread zone combinations. Um, it's sort of the the information I pull as a summary, but you can find most of these charts in uh, one of four reports. So feel free to you know, click on that, explore the available reports. Um, there is a password to access it that will be included in, um, in this slide presentation. So the last thing I wanted to leave you with was the rental market. Um, just looking at condo, unfurnished condos, process through MLS, you know, it, it has been, resale has been sort of jumping all over the place, but the rental market has been very strong for a number of months now. You know, you're going back now 17 months in a row where you've had double digit average lease price growth. Uh, you're now sitting at an average lease rate of $2,765. Um, you know, months of the inventory for leases fell to 0.8 months in March and things are starting to pick up as we move into the spring and summer market. The summer market in the rental um, world is, tends to be a lot busier, um, just, you know, students, temporary workers and so forth. So, you know, things, things, have become a lot tighter. People are still moving to Toronto, permanent residents are up, temporary workers are up, and they need a place to live. And if it's not in the resale market, um, it's typically in the rental market.
So that's um, everything on my side. Uh, hopefully there was some in interesting points there and we'll get this uh, slide deck out to you by the end of the day. I'll end here. Um, how do I stop sharing? Jason, you're still there? There we go. Okay. Any questions or feedback? Hey, Jason, on mute. Can you hear us again? I can't hear you now, yeah. I was like, wow, that's really okay. quiet. <laughs> that information is amazing, by the way. Like, I need that. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Like clients love that stuff, how it's broken down, and now we don't have to go through the painstaking exactly. process of figuring all that out. Thank you for Jason's that. He's actually only 25, but he's gone through his dad's every month. That's what's happening. <laughs> I believe it. And then, I mean, it, if the challenge sometimes is, you know, it really is important. I mean, I, I could I pull out the sort of the high level macro trends. If you dive down, you know, different pockets will obviously be performing slightly yeah. differently, and, and there is a limit on the type of, you know, information I can. I can pull. I um, uh, so hopefully you know there's some key messages, and then obviously, uh, and yeah. you can break it down by areas. Like you're like if you transact in a certain area, you can break it down as well. So yep. we'll get yeah. access to it. Yeah, that's yeah. incredible. Uh, it's uh, something that uh, that we feel as a kind of value to people. Huge, yeah. awesome. So we'll make also this presentation available. Um, but I will also send out access to access that and also some of the guides that we have just so if you want to use anything for marketing as well. And that is it. Short and sweet. We've got you over here by 1230. Thanks, Can everyone. I just ask Jason one question? Of course. Yeah. Sure. You had the um, new listings versus, um, oh, what did you have? Active. Yes. And yep. that Treb started tracking, I guess, a year ago. Um, Houses that have been on the market that had a different listing Relist strategy, relisting and you know different strategies and all that. So there was I forget the percentage. Was it one point five percent or fifteen percent? Uh, thirteen. Thirteen percent was this month. But uh, if you looked at last year, two thousand twenty-two, it was closer to you know any. It usually was ranging anywhere from like twenty-two percent to twenty-nine percent. And I think a lot of that, you know, it was as prices were starting to come down, right. people were re you know it's like oh shoot this whole strategy's changed so it was kind of interesting to also look at the sale price to list price come right. down yeah. um and now it's we're almost seeing the opposite right so it's a positive trend now that's why yes it's, yeah okay thank you exactly and i don't unfortunately you know they haven't released anything before last year so you know we don't know right maybe who knows <laughs> who knows what historical new listings really were no but it's a super interesting stat to have Great. Awesome. Again, we'll make this available for um, Joby. I think you were recording this. <clears throat> yeah. So you can share it with the team, but uh, we'll send out access to the stats and everything. So you can take a look at them. Perfect. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Bye.